Before the disciples spoke the word of God with boldness or confidence, they felt their need for prayer. There's a direct relationship between sincere prayer, God's spirit working in us, and power in proclaiming his word. They realized that to spread the gospel to the world, they had to claim the power that Christ had promised. When we seek God and pray for others, God works to bring us closer to him and gives us divine wisdom to reach them. He also works powerfully in their lives in ways we cannot see or even fully understand. There's a struggle between good and evil, between the forces of righteousness and the forces of darkness, between Christ and Satan. In this conflict, God respects human freedom. He will never manipulate the will or coerce the conscience. Force is contrary to the kingdom of God and his character of love. However, when we pray for someone, we allow him to do more. God is doing everything he can to reach people before we pray. Yet prayer combines our helplessness and weaknesses with God's omnipotent power. It's a way to be closer to God and work in partnership with him, who alone can touch the hearts. Jesus' life was one of constant prayer and relationship with his Father. At the time of his baptism, he prayed for divine power to accomplish the task before him as the saviour of all people. Our persistence in prayer acknowledges that we recognise our total dependence on God to reach those we pray for. Praying for others is biblical. Paul constantly prayed for the new Christians scattered throughout different continents. Although he was separated from those he loved, he recognised that they could be united as they prayed for each other. Throughout the Bible, there's an emphasis on being specific in prayer. Prayer is not some vague longing of the soul. It presents God with specific requests. As Jesus prayed specifically for his disciples, we also need to be specific when we pray. We have the assurance that not one prayer is lost, not one is forgotten by God. This is a comfort as we intercede for our spouses, sons, daughters, relatives, friends and work colleagues that don't know Christ. We may not always see immediate answers in those we pray for, but God is moving upon their hearts in ways we will know only in eternity. Welcome, Happy and thank heaven. you for joining us once again as we study God's holy word, because that's just what we are about to do, study God's holy word. With me today, I have Auntie Eureka. Hi, Auntie Eureka. Hi, happy Sabbath, I everybody. Karaz. Hi, Karaz. Hello. And I have Eric. Hi, guys. How are we doing? Thanks for joining us, guys. Today we are looking at prayer power. The title says it all. Let us pray before we begin. Our Father who art in heaven, Lord, this is your word. This is your time. We want to decrease and we want you to increase. Please, fathers, fill us so that as we discuss and talk about the things that pertain unto eternal life, that it may be your spirit that guides and moves us so that you may be lifted up and that we may all be drawn unto you. Thank you for hearing our prayer, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can anyone recite the memory verse for us? <laughs> It says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. A fervent, effective prayer of the righteous man availeth much. That's James 5, verse 16. It says here, the New Testament church members felt their need of prayer. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God 
with boldness. Notice, it says the disciples prayed. I wonder what it must be like to be in that upper room. Hopefully, we can create our own upper room experience. The lesson says there was a direct relationship between their prayers and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It says, after they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they went about pro proclaiming God's word with power. They were weighted with the burden of salvation of souls. They realized that the gospel was to be carried to the world, and they claimed the power that Christ had promised. When we seek God and intercede for others, God works in our own hearts to draw us closer to him and gives us divine wisdom to reach them for his kingdom. James 1 verse 5 speaks about that wisdom. And maybe I can just add a short commercial here. For those of y'all who are not joining us for midweek prayer, you missed out on what James has to say about that heavenly wisdom. He also works powerfully in the lives and in ways that we cannot see or even fully understand to draw them to himself. Yes, you guessed it. We are speaking about prayer. Auntie Eureka, can you please do Sunday's lesson for us? Well, Jason, Sunday's lesson was awesome. You know, mm. we're always interested in, in, in war stories, you know, warfare going on. And when we look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 to 9, it speaks about warfare in heaven. And I'm going to read that first, um, the, the verses. It says, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. I'm going to continue. Verse 9. The great dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. So people, when we, when we look at that verse, we can see that this great battle started in heaven. And when we move on to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, we know already from the previous verse that the devil and his angels are now on earth and they are creating um, havoc between God's people. Um, it is really an epic fight between good and evil, righteousness and unrighteousness. Ephesians 6, verse 12. I beg your pardon, let me just get my, my verse. Ephesians 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and flesh blood, and but against powers, against principalities, against the rulers of darkness of this world, and against the spiritual wickedness in high places. You and I have experienced that. We experience it from day to day. And if we are not on our knees, the devil will pull us down and we will really have a greater battle getting up onto our knees again. We are promised in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, that we have weapons to fight in this warfare. But our weapons are not guns. It's not knives. It is for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So what are these weapons? The verse continues. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, we have to stay on our knees. When you consider the strongholds, Eric, what do you think of immediately? What are these strongholds? What do I think of when you talk about strongholds, of our strongholds. faith, Auntie? Uh, things that keep us from having that true uh, binding relationship with God. What? What? What are those um, struggles, those ugly struggles mm. that we have as humans? I think it would definitely, one of them would definitely be um, work, you know, school, yeah. family. That's a big one that we, we sometimes don't seem to notice. You know, it's a, it's a little more subtle and more explainable. 
Yes. Um, yes. You know what I mean? Um, church yes. work. Hey, what do you think of that church work? Quite um, and and right because when we talk about this cosmic struggle, we know that it it came about long ago, and Michael and his angel, um, and the dragon and his angel. Then we understand this, and we we know that we're talking about the great controversy, right? Um, mm. And even though we know this, somehow we still allow these things to hinder us from fighting this battle with uh, with the full strength that we could yes. we could possibly fight it with. You know, it's very strange how we yes. know better, and yet somehow we still let these, like you're saying, strongholds uh, uh, stay up. Auntie. Keep us from from having that relationship with the Lord. Yes, um, Ephesians. Chapter 6, verse 12, also refers to putting on the full armor of God. And if you don't yes. mind, do you have your Bibles close by? I do, Auntie. Please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. I'm with you, Auntie. It says, you? Ephesians Thank you. chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Should, should I it carry on, Auntie? Just jump down to verse 18 mm -hmm. and then see how verse that 18. connects with our lesson for today. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And there we have it in a nutshell. Where prayer has to, you know, we have to stay on our knees. I thought mm. how, um, uh, Russell, when, when we have a, a, a true and, and, and close walk with the Lord, I think it would be really hard for us not to acknowledge or even um, try to make a difference in someone's life. When we see people struggling, whatever their struggles are, Eric, um, I think we would be moved with compassion. Uh, what can I possibly do for this person to see how the Lord has changed my life Mm. We cannot stand aside and watch somebody struggle. And so when we look at First um, John 5, verse 14, it says that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And therefore, intercessory prayer for our family, for friends, uh, work colleagues um, is very, very important. So mm. a, a very important thought that came through in the lesson study was that God never imposes his will on his, on, on, uh, his mm. children. And um, we have a choice. The lesson brings out that the devil cannot force us to sin. And no. neither can all the host of heaven force us to do good. And that is something God has given us a choice. So we can decide for ourselves um, whether we are going to serve God or not whether we are in that battle for good or for evil. I love the quote that we, uh, that we saw, Russell. It was the Great Controversy, page 525 in the lesson, just mm -hmm. a little lower down. It says, it is a part of God's plan to grant us, to grant, I beg your pardon, it is part of God's plan to grant us in answer to the prayer of faith that which he would not bestow, did we not thus ask. And it is important for us to ask. God is willing to go above and beyond our um, uh, dreams. You know, we, we, we cannot quite imagine what the eternal outcome would be. Not everything is revealed to us. Our lesson encourages us, encourages each and every one of us that when we pray for someone else, it opens our hearts to divine influences. While we intercede for others, God is gracious and he will never impose his will on us. 
and he gives us freedom of choice. When we pray for others, for someone else, it opens our it opens hearts for God's divine influences. And God will not leave us without the wisdom, nor the skills to be able to reach others for his kingdom. And in closing, when we uh, read Second Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1, we realize that we are co-workers with God and we must never give up the fight because we are in a cosmic struggle. Hmm. Thank you so much, Auntie Erika. Wow, this lesson is burning hot. Guys, I, uh, I don't know what to say. Eric, can you please do Monday for us? So Maybe Monday and when, Yeah, so, so when, we, when we come from this cosmic struggle, right, the, 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 the best example um, to look at when it comes to how to pray, Uncle Russell, who do you, who do you think that would be Uncle Russell? Oh, Uncle Russell is not with us, guys. So, 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 I think we would we would all agree that it would be Jesus, you know. And who better to look at um, to learn how to pray than Jesus, you know? Who better to look at to learn how to teach others to pray than Jesus? Who better to look at to learn how we can overcome? the cosmic struggle and how we can win the war than Jesus. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, and, and, and there are a few pivotal points in Jesus' life that we can look at and we can see mm, prayer there. This is, this is, this is, there, are, there are a few big lessons we can learn. Uh, Jason, can you read Luke 3 verse 21 for us? Now, while Jason is going there, Luke 3 verse 21, it, 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 we are picking up with Jesus is for lack of a better word or, or the right word that to use would be is, is, is being anointed, right? Um, and this is Luke 3, verse 21 and 22. Okay, Luke 3, verse 21 reads, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heavens was opened. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Right? And so Jesus prays, and what happens? In this instant, the, in this instant, the Holy Spirit is poured out and is manifested in a physical way and in a verbal way, in auditory way. Right? Um, so, Andy Rikas, looking at this one, at this specific story, what do you think could then be a reason to pray? What do you think that tells us also about Jesus's prayer life? Because if you if you if you look closely, Jay, can you read us again those two verses for us? Listen closely to what it says. Um, it, our minds automatically go on to, and the voice of God said, but listen before that, Jay. It reads, now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, yeah. the heavens mm. was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. So it, and praying jesus was also baptized and praying auntie Rikas, what do you think this tells us about jesus's prayer life something that caught my attention was for us to have an effective prayer life we need to have the holy spirit the way the 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 the, the dove um the holy spirit descended on jesus in the form of a dove we need the holy spirit we cannot do this in our own strength Mm -hmm. Something that I also liked, you know, when you go to the next verse, where uh, it says, uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus went, he saw some quiet part. places. All right. Um, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and yes. prayed. And it 
that seemed to be one of the key things that um, quiet, a quiet place was needed. We also mm. saw later in the lesson that Jesus um, often prayed out aloud. We tend to do, you know, the silent prayer uh, thing. Mm. And the lesson says we, we are able to stay focused. Um, right. I beg your pardon. I'm going to stop right there. I don't want to run ahead of you with the lesson. No, you, go ahead. So, so you know what the thing is? That this we are going, right? So Jesus opened his uh, messianic ministry. Yes, fancy words. Mm -hmm. So Jesus starts <laughs> his ministry as our savior with prayer. And he starts and he, the first thing is that he prays, and I'm going to quote the lesson here, for divine power to accomplish heaven's purpose. Right? And so there are two things. Number one, at the onset, Jesus prays. Okay, and you'll yes. notice in the next example that uh, when something needs to get done, when work needs to happen, what do we do? We do, right? We get our hand moving. But do we pray? When something needs to happen, you understand? And so then we move on to Luke 5, verse 16. And here we are trying to understand Jesus' prayer life quickly. And Luke 5, verse 16 says that Jesus went to a quiet place. So this tells us also that what? We can have a vibrant church prayer life. But what about our personal prayer life? Right? Yeah. Um, I see that. I, I'm not sure who's hand is up. Please, can you talk to us? Yes, um, sure. Those are two powerful points that you just brought through. Um, I just would like to re uh, mention them again so that we everyone gets it. The first is the one that you made, Eric, where it's, you said at the beginning we need to pray. You know, uh, not do and then pray. We need to pray and then do. And that one that you mentioned, Auntie Erika, where it says um, Jesus had a almost like a set place where he prayed. Um, also, when I when I read uh, the Desire of Ages, it says he was found sometimes all night in prayer. Uh, and also, there's a other place where it reads a great while before dawn, he he was found in, mm -hmm. in prayer. So so it it shows right. how Jesus valued prayer. And that for me was uh, yeah. so, so special to see. Yeah. You know, Jay, um, there's, there's another point that, 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 I, that I think is really important, you know. We just noted previously, Auntie, Auntie Rika told us that we are in a spiritual battle, right? And why then not pick up spiritual weapons? Yes, um, if we, it says again, Jesus prayed for divine power to accomplish heaven's purpose. Okay? And so often we try to white knuckle life. You know, I must do this. I have to get up at the time and I need to do this, 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 and this. And it is a divine thing. How often in your head, I don't know if it's just me, but every now and then I'll have a thought and it's like, that 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 doesn't that doesn't feel so divine, you know, Auntie Rika. Eric, uh, you know, we we may notice that um, when after Jesus' baptism, he he stepped directly into his ministry, and um, mm -hmm. when when we know what our purpose here on earth is, we we need to know that we 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 are part of a ministry, and we cannot be um, effective in our ministry if we are not praying and we right. you know when we go back to um our our um to to sabbath uh, a lesson where james chapter 5 16 says we must pray so we start by confessing and after confessing we pray for one another so that we may be healed there are so many things that stop us from having a vibrant ministry Perhaps we are not truly you. Perhaps we are uncertain about whether we are truly forgiven. Uh, sometimes things, those strongholds we spoke about, those things hold us back from effective ministry. And therefore, we need to start the way Jesus did with prayer and with the influence of the Holy Spirit um, in our lives. 
right? So like anti because there are so many things that could possibly be holding us back from having fruitful family lives, fruitful church lives, fruitful um, relationships with the world, the way we view the world, you know, um, and healthy relationships. And one of the yeah. biggest reasons would be that we clearly don't pray enough, you know? Yeah. Um, so we now, and I mean, it's, it's almost like what better reason to pray than because Jesus prayed, hey? Um, even the disciples, I'm sure the disciples prayed, but they said to Jesus, teach us to pray like yes. you pray, right? We yes. see a power in you that we don't have. So can yeah. you please share? Can you please show us, you know? Um, you. Uncle Rato, we, 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 are, we are missing your voice and your input here. So I'm going to pose a question to you, okay? Um, we look, and we are now moving through our lesson, we look at Hebrews 7, verse 25, and it says, therefore, he is also able to save, um, therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always loves, loves to make intercession. intercession for them. Uncle Ras, yeah. how does this make you feel to know the maker of the universe, the one person who probably doesn't need to pray, loves to make intercession for you? Hey, Uncle Ras? Eric, um, one of our biggest problems <coughs> in the world today is self-sufficiency. <laughs> hmm. And um, this is... This is um, this idea, like you mentioned earlier on the white knuckle stuff, where you mm. have to own it all, you have to do it all, you have to be it all. And mm -hmm. um, it results in a lot of frustration and also headaches. Um, and it's, it's comforting to know that we don't have to go through life alone. Mm. We don't have to face the challenges, the difficulties. And um, Jesus, who knows us better than we know ourselves, ever loveth to make intercession for us before the Father, knowing that we, we, we need help. And so this, this text reminds us that um, we should um, understand and always keep that top of mind that um, on our own we are going to have a difficult time, let alone uh, be able to succeed. But um, the verse reminds us that Jesus is there for us. And if Jesus um, Jesus prayed for his disciples, like you mentioned. Jesus prayed for John the Beloved. He prayed for James. He prayed for Peter. But he also prayed for Judas. And um, this, is the, this is the crux of that um, verse. That doesn't matter who you are, how good or bad you are, how successful or uh, prone to failure you are. Jesus uh, understands our need of external help. And Jesus is there, and he intercedes before his Father on our behalf, understanding and knowing our weaknesses. Mm. Jason? Eric, um, this part here where it says, um, Satan understood quite well Peter's potential for the advancement of the kingdom of God. He planned to do everything yes. possible to destroy Peter's positive influence in the Christian church. But through all of mm. these temptations, Jesus was praying for Peter. That, that really warms my heart because yeah. I know God has a plan for my life. He, yeah. he, he wants to use me uh, to influence others. And therefore, knowing that Jesus prayed for Peter. He's praying for me. Uh, the devil wants to get us down. He wants to get us down, yeah. but Jesus is there and he can't get us down so long as we hold on to the King of Kings. Yes. You know, it's also very, um, it, it, it's so good to know. Thank you, Jay. You lead us nicely into the next point that Jesus himself, God, yo, you know, the Bible literally says he ever loves his whole he loves to to be there for us so that we have access to god hey 
um, you know, it also like you saying, and so we we then go to Jason's point. We we are looking at at how the devil is sort of playing on 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 Peter's mind, and this is in Luke twenty two verses thirty one to thirty four. If anyone wants to read it, um, if anyone watching would like to read it, don't worry, we've sort of covered it. So that's where Jason. Um, drew that point from. Now, if you go and read that, which I'm sure you will, you'll also notice, um, like Jason said already, that Jesus prayed for Peter and that Jesus understood and he knows. Now, it's important for us to again just jump a little bit back to Auntie Rikas's point, uh, our first, our starting point, that this is a spiritual battle. You know, John Calvin, I think it was, said that the devil is an astute theologian. Hey? Um, and, and so our hope is not even in our ability to pray, right? Mm. It's in the power of the listener. And so we move on, and this is where intercessory prayer is so important. Because it says, listen, I can do so much for a person. I can do so much for a person's physical well-being. You know, if they are sick, I can I can give them soup. If they are poor, I can give them food. If they are spiritually destitute and they need Jesus, I can tell them. But the power does not lie with me or my ability to pray. It lies with Christ. And Paul was a great intercessory Pre-maker, pre prayer, you know? Um, and so it's also important for us as we look at now going into Tuesday's section of the lesson. The first sentence says, intercessory prayer, biblical. Again, so we have now two, two massive reasons. Jesus prayed, prayer is biblical, right? Um, uh, Uncle Russ, if you can, let us dissect together and then um, I'm going to move, I'm going to lay down my mic. Um, Algaras, can you read for us Ephesians 1 verses 15 to 21? For this cause I also, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which is among you, and the love which you show toward all the saints, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what the exceeding greatness of his power to us would who believe, according to that working of the strength of his might, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and made him to sit at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Um, Jason, would you like to say something? Is that you, Jay? I think it's Auntie Eureka's. Do you want to say something, Auntie Eureka? Um, Eric, something that I found also very interesting, you know, Jesus prayed, um, when we read John chapter 17, 6 to 19, um, Jesus yes. prays for himself, he prays yes. for the disciples, and he continues on, um, and he prays for all the believers. And here on earth, he um, interceded for all those who would um, who are his followers and those who would go out um, in ministry to win souls. And then we also see when we look at um, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, Jesus is now interceding in heaven. He is our high priest in heaven. And he presents our jumbled prayers to God and there God the Father then um, responds to Jesus who is our intercessor and also our advocate 
and presents our prayers to him. And we cannot possibly um, miss how much we are loved and that we are forgiven. The promises that are given, First John 1 verse uh, 1 verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. So that is assurance uh, that that God, that Jesus truly has um, our best interest at heart when he speaks to the Father. Isaiah 44, 22, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud. And then we look again, Psalms 103 verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And lastly, I just want to mention Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 16. None of the sins he has committed will be remembered against him. And we, we are assured that Jesus is not only our intercessor, he is our God, he is our Father, and he is our friend. Hmm. Hmm. Uncle Raf, you wanted to, to you want to add to that, Uncle Raf? <clears throat> Okay, so you know it's so important for us to fully understand the depth to which Christ intercedes for us. Thank you so much for that, Auntie Rikas. And this is the thing, though, that this power is only accessed through prayer. Yes, Uncle Russell. Sorry, man, my mic was off. Um, no what problem, I was saying, Uncle Eric, Russell. is um, if we read Matthew twenty-five, verse forty-one. It's a very familiar and a thought-provoking uh, passage where Jesus says, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, ye have done it unto me. And we, we sometimes tend to forget, if we go back to the Old Testament, when Abram interceded for the people in Sodom, right. um, that was the time when um, he was, it, 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 uh, um, it was, it was shown that he was his walk with God was very um, close and very serious um, for him to place himself at risk and to um, because remember he he, um, he knew that it was God and um, for a normal um, human being to um, to approach God or someone mighty and powerful and in authority it was very dangerous. But he went out and he, he um, disregarded his own safety and he said um, he, he put his life on the line for the lives, for the sake of those people that um, he was concerned about. And mm. if you look after, and, and, and if, you, if we read the account, it says this um, faith that Abram had in God's ability to save, not just to um, with, with Isaac um, and the, pro, the son of the promise, but this ability to um, believe that God loves everyone and that God um, is interested in the well-being and salvation of everyone. That is where we are truly, if, if we believe the same, then we are truly counted as righteous. If you look at Moses, when um, God told him to stand aside, let him um, destroy the Israelites. Moses also said, Lord, um, don't do this for the sake of your name, but... Um, Destroy me, take my yeah. life, er eradicate yeah. me. So um, this is the thing about intercessory prayer. Jesus said, um, by this we know love, if you are willing to lay down your life for someone else. Yeah. And, and, and this is, this, this is mm. the crux of, of this intercessory prayer. Do we care enough about people that we can say, look, uh, let them be saved. Um, just um, do something for them, even if it means that I must give up my rights, but... Uh, so you, you're giving um, everything you have for the sake of someone else. That's and true generosity is, and true righteousness. Right. And this is, again, it's accessed through intercessory prayer. It's, it's manifested. That spirit is manifested in true intercessory prayer. Jay, do you want to add anything before we move on to Paul? The, um, that point, um, I think, is what... I, uh, you brought it out so beautifully, Russell, where the lesson is saying uh, when you pray for others, you yourself are being saved. And, and yes. uh, I think you just brought it out so beautifully. Thanks. Thanks for that. Yes. Um, can we ask you to do Wednesday and Thursday, Ankaras? 
All right, Thank Wednesday, you, we're talking about um, unseen powers at work. Now, do you know what? For me, um, sometimes it's, um, I like to um, fight for the oppressed and people that I feel are being um, abused, all right? But you know what's very frustrating is when you fight for those people, and it seems they're not interested. If you look behind you uh, to see where they are, they um, willing or um, to, to also stand with you because you're fighting for them. And you look and you see they're not interested or they're scared. Um, mm. When I read about this thing about the Israelites in um, Babylon, and Daniel knows that because he's been studying the prophecies and he knows mm. that um, it's time for the Jews to go back to Jerusalem. But if you look at the, um, the people in um, Babylon at the time, not many of them wanted to go back. They wanted to remain because it was comfortable. It was convenient. And um, the one down now, um, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this, because at times today, it's difficult for us to understand why people do the things they do, even though it doesn't make sense to us. But uh, um, the point comes out that there are unseen forces at work. There might be things that we don't understand about ourselves, about other people, about situations. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if, we, if we go to the story in Daniel 10, from verse 10 to 14, Daniel is perplexed because he's been praying, he's been fasting, he's mm -hmm. been um, entreating God uh, to know what is going to happen to the promise mm -hmm that God had made to his people. And it seems there's no answer. Hmm. And um, a few weeks after this, he gets the, um, the answer. But I think it must have been difficult for him during that time of silence. And so, um, Eureka, um, I'd like to pose a question to you. What do you do when it seems that you pray and you pray and you pray, but you don't get the answer straight away? Or... Um, Especially, okay, uh, let's first say about in your own life. I'm not talking now about when you pray for someone else or your spouse, but in your own life, if you pray about things that for your own benefit, how does it make you feel? You know, often, Russell, uh, we, we, we do find ourselves in a, in a place where we have to um, continue praying, you know, pray without ceasing. Um, and during that process, there's, there's, a, there's a refinement. You know, we are taught to wait and become quiet. Sometimes we have our own agendas. Sometimes our motives are not correct. And we God redirects our prayers. You know, we may start out with, Lord, please bless me with the job. And then there's some other lesson that we need to learn. If you had a job before and you were not, other, I'm just making an example now. If you had a job before and you were um, not working with your money, you were not budgeting, you were reckless, um, and now you find yourself in a place where you, you know, you are really struggling, and you pray again, and God needs to teach you certain lessons, um, patience, and that you can do without certain things that you thought were an absolute necessity in your life, and so. We start examining our motives. We examine ourselves. What is it, Lord, that you really want me to pray for? You know, is it just a job? Is it just a new car? Or do you want me to have a closer book to leave my self-sufficiency, to leave, uh, uh, you know, stop thinking that um, I can do all things myself rather than I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength, who opens the doors for us. So for me, uh, uh, Russell, it is praying without ceasing. I like the stories. Normally, you know, on the, at the end of Friday section, there's those mission stories. And mm -hmm. um, this week's story tells about this um, aircraft mechanic. And when the um, planes that he worked on were decommissioned, he wanted to be a flight controller. Mm -hmm. But because of his medical record, um, they denied him this position. And for a while, he said he prayed about this because he really wanted to do this. But um, his prayers, according to what it looked like, um, were left unattended to. 
But then he says, um, because he wasn't able to get that job, he started doing something else. And then, um, because he had more time now, he was able to uh, spend more time reading the Bible and um, seeking for truth. And then he stumbled upon the Sabbath and other truths in the Bible. And um, at the end of it, um, he, him and his wife started looking for a church that kept the Sabbath because during his studies, he found out about the Sabbath truth. And they, they got to the church and they got baptized. And then he was sharing his faith with other people. And at the end of the story, he says that if God had answered his prayer the way he wanted it to be answered, um, he would not have had time to go through the Bible. He would not have had the opportunity to um, find all these wonderful truths and to share this with so many other people. Mm -hmm. So um, we should understand that um, we can't always see the end from the beginning. And God's yeah. perspective is, is, is much better than ours. And it's much clearer. So, um, But the other thing we should also understand is that at times when we think that nothing is happening, God is working behind the scenes. Because if you look at in Daniel 10, it talks about um, the prince of Persia. All right. Yes. Um, now, it doesn't talk about the king of Persia. So the king was the um, uh, Darius and Cyrus. But it talks about the prince of Persia, refer, Persia refer, referring to Satan. And this is yes. something that we forget. Um, we forget that we... Um, we don't only struggle with people and a job and um, the economy, but we struggle against unseen powers, wickedness in high places, and not just one, but but um, there are there are um, countless evil angels associated with Satan that is trying to um, get between us and God. So, um, but the good news is that when um, we have, when we face these difficulties, we are not left alone. Eric said that um, Jesus' very life is um, consumed by interceding for us. And here in this, in this um, passage, we find that when the angels could not defeat Satan, Michael, um, Jesus himself came down and he mm -hmm. defeated Satan to, 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 to let Daniel see that, look, I haven't forgotten about you. Even though um, days and weeks went by and it seemed as if you were forgotten and your prayers were unanswered, Jesus himself comes down and he says, I will fight for you. So when the mm -hmm. angel comes to Daniel, he says, let me just share some background information that God loves you. And he hears when you call on his name, especially when you when you entreat um, regarding other people, when you intercede and when you cry out um, and when you're concerned about other people. So that was the interesting for me, interesting thing for me that came out in um, Wednesday, the unseen powers at work, not just Satan trying to disrupt things, but also God um, through um his resources, um, the Holy Spirit, the angels, and in this case, Jesus himself coming and joining in the fight. So that, that to me is, Eric, what do you think of that? Having, can I, having can Jesus I himself fight for you. Can I share yes. what I think? Uh, you know what, Russell? Uncle? It, it... Okay, let Jason go first, then Eric, you. Yeah, um... On Wednesday evening, when we were speaking about um, rejoicing in, was it um, perseverance, type of thing. Yes. And for me, this part uh, really makes you want to rejoice in in in, in that wait or that delay. Uh, but we're not always reminded of it. But when we are in prayer and we 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 by faith. Uh, look through the, the eye of faith and we see what is happening in this conflict. We, we see Jesus fighting on our behalf. Uh, it then uh, can make us rejoice, uh, Kevin. Uh, but uh, unless we do that, we, we, we will be overcome. Eric? 
Thank you, Jason. Um, we we can. Uh, are you saying thank you because he called you Kevin Uncle or because of his comment? <laughs> no. <laughs> so you know what? That is, that is, I really liked um, Wednesday, and it was one of my favorite days for this reason. That, guys, not only does Jesus love to intercede for us, but he loves to fight uh, for us as well, to fight on our behalf. You know, he's like that parent, Uncle Russell, I'm sure, Auntie Rikas, even Jason, I'm sure y'all can all testify now that when your child is doing weird things, man, you know, you're just standing there, or even when things are going perfectly fine, but you know it can be better, you're just standing and you're like, please ask me, please ask me, please ask me, please ask me. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that's Jesus. He's just like, hello, can you please, I, I just want to, please, let me, you know, and as soon as we pray, he's like, ah, ah look at me, and he still needs me, you know, and do we not need Jesus? Yeah, Eric, you you um you raised an interesting point there. Um, there are times when God cannot contain Himself, and David mentioned as he said before, or some of the Old Testament writers they said before mm. we called, God stepped in. He delivered us before we even uttered knowing uh, what we would need. But um, this is why Jesus told His disciples the spray. And um, when we face difficulties, when it seems to us that um, heaven is silent and our prayers have um, maybe we dialed the wrong number, so to speak. When we, when we go through the Lord's Prayer again, we are reminded that we have a Father in heaven. Not an earthly father who's busy with work or maybe forgets or um, has other commitments. We have a heavenly father who has a clear vision and who loves us beyond what we can understand. And he is there for us. And um, then it also says we need to understand um, how holy God is and how powerful and majestic he is. And then also we need to place ourselves in heaven's hands because it says um, let your will be done on earth even is even as it is done in heaven so uh, sometimes we see things from our earthly perspective and we want things done a certain way but if we place ourselves in heaven's hands if we if we pray the lord's prayer more often or with the specific steps understanding that we have someone that cares for us he is high, is exalted, is holy, is righteous, is all powerful, and um, and then we should also commit our our ways, our desires, our longings um, to His um, omnipotence. Then it 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 gives us a different perspective, and it helps us during those quiet, those silent times when it seems that um, the connection is lost between us and heaven. Yes, Eureka. Um, sorry to interrupt you, Russell. I don't know if anybody on the panel um, experienced, you know, sometimes we pray uh, and, and we're really waiting for an answer. And earlier on, you know, I spoke about um, you pray without ceasing. And, you know, the, the, the lesson points a finger at you sometimes. And it, it, it's, so, it's so encouraging to, to, to see, you know, what, what it what is. Is it what am I doing that's stopping uh, me from, you know, receiving that power, making a difference? The things that I'm praying for, why am I not getting answers? And, um, you know, when I read Isaiah chapter 59, verses 2, it said, uh, But your iniquities, <clears throat> pardon, have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his, hidden his face from you. So that you will not hear, and you know, again, we get back to our um, uh, when we started the lesson study in James chapter five. Uh, was it sixteen? Uh, where we have to confess our mm. sins, mm. and we, we 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 have to put on the whole armor of God so that we can experience that power uh, that that is lacking in our lives, and you know, mm -hmm. we can continue to pray and pray. 
um, not realizing that there's unconfessed sins in our lives and we need to open those channels so that we can understand how God works. Eric? For me, um, that I've learned about praying from this lesson is also that w when <coughs> when we pray, we the more we pray for others, the more we realize how much we need prayer, right? But the more we talk about others, or you know, behind their backs, or instead of praying about it, we talk about it. It it sort of magnifies their weakness. If you're understanding what I'm saying, whereas when we pray, it just says, yo, I need more prayer. It, it, and this is the, the point that we, our eyes are then open to the spiritual battles that are going on um, behind the scenes, like we said um, from Uncle Russell's section. Okay, so now you, Eureka and Eric, you touched on something, um, but it leads us into Thursday's part. Um, okay, Jason, you want to say something? I'm, I'm just saying that uh, we're running out of time, so um, okay. if we can just run through Thursday and then we can close. Okay. All right, so um, I'm just, I'm reading something here from, um, what is it? Um, Okay, but it's a quotation, CSA. Um, it says, The darkness of the evil one encloses those who neglect to pray. The whispered temptations of the enemy entice them to sin. And it is all because they do not make use of the privileges that God has given them in the divine appointment of prayer. Why should the sons and daughters of God... Be reluctant to pray when prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse where are treasured the boundless resources of omnipotence. Um, that was a very powerful uh, quotation that I found. But it ties up with our memory verse. And because remember Thursday's part talks about, um, it talks about the focus of prayer. And like Eric mentioned, um, Eric said that there are times when we um, talk about people, but when you have difficulties with people, why don't you talk <laughs> to God about the difficulties? When you have difficulties with yourself, um, talk to God about it. If we look at what Paul did with the, um, Paul had specific um, prayers that he had when he, when, when he um, mentioned the Ephesians, the Philippians, and the Colossian Christians. He prayed for his young colleagues, such as Timothy, Titus, and John mm. Mark. And um, so um, Samuel said, Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. So mm. sometimes mm. We, 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 we look at mm. sin as, No, I didn't tell lies. I didn't gossip. I didn't steal. I didn't do funny st things. But Samuel says, if I don't intercede for someone else, knowing that they have problems, then I am, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of the sin of omission. Um, not that I'm doing something wrong, but I'm not doing something right and something that's necessary. And um, we also see that um, when, when, when Job said, he, 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 it's like a plea. He says that, oh, that one might plead for a man with God. But uh, so Jesus comes on the scene and he shows us uh, in answer to Job's request. He says, you can intercede for someone. You can plead for someone on, um, on their behalf. And you know what's the nice thing about prayer? There are times when people feel, um, I don't need God in my life. Or with this specific problem, um, I'm not going to go to God. But you know what happens when we pray, when we intercede as believers for that specific person, we, we um, give heaven permission to do things in that person's life where without that prayer, heaven's hands would have been tied. Um, yeah. And this is why the, 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 the memory verse is so important where it says we need to confess our sins to one another. We're not in this boat alone. 
We're not in this fight alone. And on our own, we're going to make mistakes and we're going to lose the battle. But um, besides the fact that heaven is on our side, when we see our brother failing, when we see our brother falling, when we see our brother struggling, we should understand that we have a responsibility to intercede for that person. And you know what happens when we intercede for that person? Yeah. Sometimes we have people that rub us up the wrong way. Maybe our spouses do that to us sometimes, isn't it, uh, Jason and Eureka? But, but, okay. but when we pray, when we present those problems to God, I found that many times when I pray about Violet, then, I'm, then heaven comes back with a message, but you need help more than Violet. Mm. But mm -hmm. when I open myself up to pray for my spouse, for my wife, I'm reminded that I need more grace. And when I accept that grace, do you know what? That difficulty that I had with my wife, it, 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 it's resolved. It's sorted out, not because there was necessarily a problem with the other person, but I had a problem with myself that I didn't realize. So this is prayer is, is powerful. It's not just for other people. Same like witnessing. It, it's beneficial for other people. But we who practice this, we are the greatest recipients of the benefits of, of, of prayer and witnessing. Jason, um, that's, that's the end of my section. Um, there's a statement there on Thursday that says, Satan cannot endure to have his powerful rival appealed to, for he fears and trembles before God's strength and majesty. At the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host trembled. What a lovely mm. thought. I think we, we can end it there. Um, thanks to you guys. Um, let us uh, close for a word of prayer. Our oh, Father who art in heaven, Lord, I am guilty of neglecting prayer. But this lesson has been so beautiful, Lord, in that it has shown us that not only by interceding for others do we assist them heavenward, but in so doing, we ourselves are, are making our own calling and election sure. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of prayer. Thank you for the opportunity to pray to you. And thank you for being always willing and able to uh, not only hear our prayer, but to answer our prayer according to thy divine will. Lord, we want to ask that as we spend this day in contemplation of all that you do and all that you are to us, that indeed your spirit may move in our hearts and that he may have his way in our lives. Thank you for hearing our prayer, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. That evening, the people saw the second worst fire in the history of Manaus, a city of 2.1 million located in the heart of the northern Brazilian Amazon rainforest. Approximately 600 houses in a very poor neighborhood were destroyed, leaving 2,500 people without a home and even their personal belongings. By the end of the day, local Adventist churches and ADRA had already served 300 meals and given 500 basic food baskets, clothes, bedding, shoes, and other necessities to those who had lost almost everything. While many residents stood in line to receive help from the church or government for their basic needs, one Haitian popsicle seller thrilled the relief teams with an impressive act of altruism. Even though most of the Haitians living in Brazil struggle to survive as refugees after an earthquake ravaged their country in 2010, this man walked up the line of the survivors, giving away all the popsicles remaining in his box. These popsicles were his only source of income. A small act, a huge impact. As a modern representative of the poor widow, this man was moved to give all that God had placed in his hand in order to help others. As you return your tithe and give your promise, 
pray that the Lord enables you to imitate Christ, who sacrificed all, even his life, for the redemption and well-being of others. May we put our desires last and God first. Are you someone who longs for a relationship with a happily ever after ending? Buckle up to find out the truth of your own story and how to turn the tide successfully. Picture this. Scientists are able to predict whether a couple stays happily married or will get a divorce within the next five years with an alarming accuracy of around 80%. How? When people degrade each other with criticism, it's a given fact that a breakup is near. In the next five minutes, we will show you exactly what to do when negativity enters your relationship. So the key word is criticism. Criticism isn't constructive feedback or even a complaint. It rather is an attack on the personality. This direct personal attack hijacks important parts of our brain where it activates our ancient defense mechanisms of fight, flight, or freeze. This means that after a critic attack, the partner that received the criticism will either fight back, goes away, or simply freezes. Whatever the reaction, this interaction is devastating for each intimate romantic relationship. Perpetual criticism leads to resentment, hatred, and an eventually frozen heart, which in turn will slowly but surely lead to a breakup. How do we escape this cycle of hurt? Can we beat science? Should we, as experts often advise, abandon the relationship and find a more loving and secure partner? But what if there are children involved and you can't just leave? Or when there is enough love left to fight for? What if you are the one that's considered critical in this or your next relationship? Either way, when we want to save our relationship, we surely need to learn more loving ways of connecting with each other, right? But how? To break this spell, we need to have a solid understanding of what the criticizing person really is up to. One important thing to understand is this. Criticism most likely isn't proof of a rotten character, although at times it surely may feel this way. So if it's not a character trait, then what is it? The critic is one of six main defense mechanisms that some of us were forced to develop in our early childhood. We call them heart defenders. That's exactly what they'll do. They keep the most valuable and vulnerable part of us safe from harm. This critic is a reaction pattern in our psyche that protected us as a child from a harsh, demanding environment. Think of parents that pushed you to the limit, or teachers that judged you and made a fool of you in front of everyone. In fact, it's our Western competitive society that makes the perfect conditions for the critic in us. Picture this, for example. Your parents were concerned with your future and knew that you would secure your future the best when you got high grades. You did your best to live up to their expectations. One day you came home with just average results. Your parents were disappointed and said things like, if only you would be more like your brother. Their disappointment left a deep mark on your soul. From that day on, you will push yourself to the limit and start to dismiss yourself in exactly the same tone of voice your parents or teachers did. Hence, the birth of the critic. Don't misbehave, you fool. What is wrong with you? Or, you dumb retard, you will never succeed. Are some sentences you'll tell yourself from that day on, just so you'd behave and do what is expected. So realize this, the critic isn't your enemy. It's one of your heart defenders, and his only goal is to keep you safe. That's how the critic came into your life. Born from the fear of being not good enough, being laughed at or dismissed, which directly refers to your instinctual fear of being banned. This deep, fearful instinct makes us hurt ourselves and push ourselves around to stay safe so others won't judge and hurt us. As children, we rather receive conditional love by behaving as told than to face the risk of falling out of grace. Once the critic is in position and trained to shove you around, it often starts to judge others too. These valuable insights might already soften your own judgment. 
Next time, when your spouse hurts you with some sort of criticism, realize that in fact you're attacked by a scared-to-death kid. Know that one of its basic needs for safety is in danger, and that its basic defense mechanism is to hurt before it can be hurt. Once both of you own these powerful insights, it can be turned around for the better. The critic can learn to use language that connects, even when he or she is scared or feels threatened. The other partner can learn to see through the critic's behavior and help the critic to look past its harsh judgments and to feel into its deep-rooted fears. Remember that at the root of the feeling of being not good enough are the critic's fears of being abandoned. So instead of reacting to its harsh controlling words, learn to see through its fears and to soothe them. This eases the fears and makes room for vulnerability and therefore loving connection, the key to happily ever after. It takes two to tango. This dance of lovers is what we call the real love commitment. A dance where you see through your imprinted defense mechanisms and learn how to dismantle them. So real love gets a chance to make a warm, connecting, and intimate bond for life. Love's purest function. Good day, church family. I would like to invite each one of you to our Garden of Three this morning. This separation has really impacted on how we engage with each other. So many special occasions were missed, like Mother's Day and Father's Day and Communion. And I want to acknowledge moms like Auntie Teresa, Auntie Marlene, Auntie Winnie, Auntie Cicely, Auntie Ursula, Auntie Yellen, Auntie Iggy, Auntie Denise. Auntie Bramble, Auntie Rose, Auntie Audrey, Auntie Pat, Auntie Crystal, Auntie Sheila, Auntie Liz, moms that we have lost, like Auntie Ashla. You all mean so much to us, and I pray that God will sustain you through this very difficult period. Our dads, Uncle Ian, you are always a mentor, and you will always be. Uncle Keith, Uncle Ravel, you will always be pillars in this church. We remember Pastor Coombs. He ordained me as a deacon and then as an elder. Church, we have lost so much. I see tears in my mom's eyes every Sabbath. And I know many of our parents miss church the same way my mom does. But I would like to encourage you this morning church with Romans 8 verse 38 for I am convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God neither death nor life neither angels nor demons neither the fears of today or the worries of tomorrow not even the powers of hell can separate us from the love of God church let's pray king of kings and lord of lords father we are nothing without you my god and this morning father we we come before you humbly father asking for your love and your presence and your holy spirit to to be with us always my god father we remember the sick this morning father Father, I pray in a very special way, Father, for Dr. Saunders, my God. I pray that you, you be with her, Father, and you restore her to her full health, my God. Be with Auntie Teresa in a very special way, my Father. Never leave her, Father. Comfort her and keep her, my God. Father, I pray in a very special way for Auntie Ursula, my God. Restore her to full health, my God. Be with Renee as well, my Father. Please heal her, my God. Then, Father, we bring Lucille before you, my Jesus. Father, I pray in a very special way that you, you restore Lucille's health, Father. Lord, you are the great physician, my God, and there is no one like you. Father, we pray in a very special way, Father, that you be with the needy and the hungry, Father. Father, this, this pandemic has left many destitute, my God. Father, many have lost their jobs. And Father, we pray that you be present in their lives. 
comfort them and keep them, Father. Help them to know that, that you are the King of Kings, the Jehovah Jireh. Lord, and that you will never leave them nor forsake them, my God. Father, I pray in a very special way for the lonely, my God. There are many that are separated from loved ones. And we pray, Father, that you be with them, you comfort them, and let them know, Father, that you will that you will always be there with them, my God. Father, I pray in a very special way, Father, for those that have lost loved ones, my God. Please keep them close to your side. We remember, Father, Sister Coombs. Bless her and keep her, Father. Father, you help her to know that you are there, Father, no matter what trials or tribulations come her way. Father, be with the Eustace family. Be with Uncle Christy, Father. Comfort him. Help him to know that you are his God and that you never leave him nor forsake him. Be with Marky and Lester as well. Bless them and keep them, Father. Comfort them, Father. My God, I pray, Father, that you be with us through the further hours of the Sabbath, my God. And Lord, I pray that you be behind us, Father, so that when we look back, we see you, Lord, our refuge, our, sh our shelter in the time of storm. Lord, be beside us. Wrap your loving arms around us, my Father. Lord, we pray that you go before us so that we follow in your footsteps and remain faithful until you soon return. Lord, be within us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Father, so that your love can shine through us towards others, my God. Father, help us to be present to our community and help them to know through your love that you will always be there for them. Lord, I pray this prayer with all my heart in your loving name. Amen. I wouldn't like to say out loud that Laurie was lazy because he'd probably be very much offended and I don't like to offend anybody, but I'm afraid that was the truth. No matter what it was that you asked Laurie to do, you would always reply, I can't. For every job, he seemed to have an excuse. If you asked him to bring in a load of coal, he would say, I can't, it's too heavy. Or if you asked him to go on an errand, he would say, I can't. <sighs> I'm too tired. Perhaps you would ask him to wipe the dishes. Then he would say, I can't. That's a girl's job. Of course, none of his excuses were valid. And I'm quite sure that the real trouble with Laurie was just pure laziness. You see, he said, I can't, only when there was work to be done. He never said it at playtime or when his friend would come to the door and ask him to go cycling or play ball. Then it was always, all right, I'll be ready in a moment. Laurie's mother had told him many times that it wasn't fair that he never helped with any of the work in the home and yet was so ready to run off and play. But Laurie was just the same as ever the next day and all mother had said did not seem to make any difference. But one day, mother had a bright idea. The next morning, Laurie stayed in bed so long that he was late for school. Usually mother would call him in good time only to be answered by a dozy, I can't get up. I'm sleepy. This morning, however, Mother let Laurie get up when he liked, and that was very late indeed. He was cross when he came downstairs and wanted to have breakfast immediately, but there was none for him. Why didn't you get my breakfast? he asked. I can't, said Mother with a curious smile. I'm so tired. Very angry, Laurie ran off to school without any breakfast. He was so late that the teacher scolded him in front of the class, which made him cross the stall. On the way home, he climbed a fence with some other boys and coming down, found himself hooked on a rusty nail. He managed to get down at last, but left a part of his trousers on the top of the fence. When he got home, he wanted mother to mend them at once. I can't, said mother. I'm too busy. And I have to go back to school like this? Asked Laurie, pointing at the hole in his trousers. I'm afraid so, said mother. And go we had to, greatly to the amusement of the boys and girls. When Laurie got back from school, of course he wanted his supper at once, for he had not had much to eat that day. But there was nothing on the table. 
He was greatly surprised, for he had been used to finding everything ready for him. You haven't got the supper ready? He said to Mother. No, said Mother. I can't. I'm tired. I just didn't feel like it tonight. But I want to go out and play immediately after supper, said Laurie. All right, said Mother, not stirring from her armchair and looking back at the book she was reading. Go ahead. I don't mind. But aren't you going to get me any supper? I can't. I'm tired. Laurie stormed out of the house and slammed the door. But as he was going down the street, he began to think things over. Perhaps Mother was tired after all. Maybe she really needed someone to help her. Perhaps she really was too tired to get her own supper ready. Laurie stopped. He thought of the game of ball that he was going to enjoy and then of his little mother sitting at home, too tired to even get her own supper ready. He began to feel sorry that he had been so cross. He would go back. Peeping through the kitchen window, Laurie saw that mother had gone to sleep in her armchair. At once he realized that this was his opportunity to make all things right. At heart he really was a good boy, even though he had that very strong tendency to laziness where work was concerned. Creeping into the kitchen on tiptoe, he washed up the dishes as silently as he could. And then, still more quietly, he crept into the dining room and laid the table. To be quite frank, this was the first time for many months that Laurie had laid the table, but he made quite a fine job of it. He put out all the nicest things he could find, even brought in some flowers from the garden, and altogether made the table look as though someone extra special were coming to supper. Then he noticed that he had forgotten to bring the butter dish and went to fetch it. Unfortunately, it was a little greasy and slipped out of his hands, falling with a crash to the floor. Mother awoke and jumped out of a chair as though something dreadful had happened. She had been dreaming about Laurie and the noise had come just as he had been getting into trouble. But her fears were soon turned to joy as she saw the neatly set table. Wow! she exclaimed. Who would have believed you could set a table so nicely? They had a lovely meal together and Mother never said a word about the broken dish all evening. Laurie was so happy that he determined that he would really help Mother more after this. Just as they were finishing supper, there was a, no a knock on the door and a boy's voice called out. Come on, Laurie, we're all waiting for you. Sorry, I can't come, said Laurie. I'm going to help Mother this evening. But Mother overheard and she came rushing to the door. It's all right, Laurie, this time. You can help me tomorrow. Overjoyed, Laurie ran off and my... That was the best game of ball he ever played. Jesus wants us to help wherever we can and in that way make other lives easier. Oh yeah. 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 If you wanna be
I have a friend so precious, so very dear to me. He loves me with such tender love. He loves so faithfully. I could not live apart from him. I love to feel him nigh, and so we dwell together, my Lord and I. Sometimes I'm faint and weary. of life beneath the sunny sky and so we walk together my Lord and I I tell him all my sorrows I tell him all my joys I tell him all that pleases me I tell him what a noise He tells me what I ought to do He tells me how to try And so we talk together My Lord and I He knows that I am longing Some weary soul to so he bids me go and speak the loving word for him. He bids me tell his wondrous love and why he came to die. And so we work together, my Lord and I. And so we work Greetings. Today we're going to be discussing the topic of repentance as Mother White brings it out in her in her book Steps to Christ. Um, my personal view on repentance, or one thing, uh, my opinion on this is that, you know, we we can easily read this chapter over and over again, and we tend to sort of get ideas from it, and we tend to sort of preach ideas from it and we quote a section from it but we don't richly dig for what is it saying what is repentance to us and i think after reading through this again and again once we understand what repentance truly is we realize that how we operate and what we do and how we've been doing things it seems sort of wrong it seems like we've had a misunderstanding of the term repentance and a misunderstanding of what repentance is to us. So my desire is to teach this topic and bring it out in light of what Mother White tells us and also just to develop an understanding of what fake repentance is and what real repentance is. You know, I'll read the first few lines of the chapter and it says, how shall a man be just with God? How shall a sinner be made righteous? It is only through Christ that we can be brought into harmony with God, with holiness. But how are we to come to Christ? Many are asking the same question as did the multitude on the day of Pentecost. When convicted of sin, they cried out, what shall we do? 
the first word of Peter's answer was, Repent. Acts 2, 37 and 38, another time shortly after he said, Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Acts 3, 19. So, it's been an age-old problem. Repentance has been something from really for years and years that has been a question on the hearts of those who are those who are converted to Christ repentance is actually you know been in the mind from the moment we're converted we're like but I've done so much wrong in my life and what am I going to do to rectify this wrong how can I be made right again and you know it goes on to say that repentance includes sorrow for sin and turning away from it we shall not renounce sin unless we see it in its sinfulness. Unless we turn away from it in heart, there will be no real change in life. Now, what is it to repent? I think the term and condition given here, that repentance includes a sorrow for sin, but also a turning away from it. That we can accept as a definition of repentance. Because repentance needs to be something that we actualize, something that we do. I've been saying this a lot recently that we have a lot of information. We have a plethora of information, but we do not actualize this information. We read it, we teach it, but we don't actualize it. We don't make it a reality around us. We don't repent fully. We don't come to Christ with this full repentance but here's what we do and you know Ellen White makes it so clear that we are not the first ones to make this mistake that it's been a mistake in the Bible that we see many biblical characters and figures making this mistake you know because there's a fake understanding of what repentance is you see Mother White goes on in this chapter and she begins explaining to us that, you know, repentance is supposed to be an acknowledgement of sin and a turning away from it. And it's a sincere action, you know. It's something you do with all your heart. It's something that you make a reality. It's something that has to be real. But this is what we understand repentance to be and what many of us fall in the pit of the fake repentance or the fake understanding of repentance we tend to fear and this is an idea that mother white brings to us we tend to fear the the repercussions of sin we tend to fear not making it into heaven we tend to fear not making making ourselves right we tend to fear that we'll die before we're right and that is why we repent that is why we turn away from our wrong wrongdoings because we are fearful of burning forever we are fearful of harsh punishment and this is just a humanly response i mean if you look at a child when you know when a child gets shouted at now the child won't say okay i did wrong and this is it a child will only say i did wrong not because, you know, they want to admit that they're doing wrong and they want to change because they'll do the same mistake again. They'll do the same problem again. But they're saying sorry immediately, not because they truly are sorry, but because they fear the beating that might come. They fear the punishment that comes with it. They fear the, you know, the punishments. Let's just put it like that. So when we talk about repentance, many of us repent often not because we want to be made right with God but because we don't want to feel the wrath of God and this is a problem this is a huge problem but you know understanding that we are not the first ones that actually have went through this problem there was others before us Isu if you remember his story in the Bible he only got to a point of sincerity and this is brought up by mother white only because of fear but also judas judas only came to that point of understanding only through fear and the same with pharaoh only through that fear and that i want this rightness but there's that fear aspect and you know i really like that she illustrates through three biblical characters And, you know, 
so that fear aspect it really is something that messes up our repentance process it messes up how we are made right with god because instead of wanting to be made right with God, instead of this genuine sincerity of coming, the sincere nature of coming to God and saying, Lord, please forgive me, I've wronged you and I don't want to do this wrong anymore. We are coming there and we might say those exact words, but the motive behind our heart is, I don't want to be punished. I don't want to be harmed. I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to experience the wrath of God. So therefore, out of fear, I will repent. And it's sad because you miss out on what repentance does for you. Because fear is associated with another concept that Mother White brings out. And a concept that we constantly fear, uh, it's not fear, constantly experience when we do wrong. Fear comes with guilt. And even when you ask God to forgive you of that horrible, heinous sin that you've committed against him and ask him to make it right with you, because you are driven by fear, fear has a way of creeping back into our lives. That after we ask for forgiveness, we, we get it, but fear will always reign there. And then comes guilt. We're constantly reminding you of, you will be killed if you do this. You will be hurt if you do this. God will punish you if you do this. Guilt now becomes a ruling factor of our life. And repentance, the result of true repentance is not guilt, but it is peace. It is not fear, but it is love. So you are not to be a fearful, guilty person and think about being this guilty person your whole life. When you walk through things, think of all the wrong you've done and feel like you are the guiltiest person on earth because of what you've done. Guilt and fear, if they are there, only need to be there shortly. But sincerity and coming to God with the true meaning of repentance it heals, it brings peace to you. She goes on and she says that it is only Christ. It begins with only Christ and she continues to say, it is only Christ that can truly grant us this gift of forgiveness. It is only Christ that can truly help us to come to a repentive state because If you try and do anything on your own in making yourself right, you will dig yourself deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper down this dark hole of loneliness. If you divorce Christ from any process of Christ healing you or getting the Christian healing that you need, if you remove Christ from it, I can assure you that it's not going to go well. I don't know who's going to lie to you and say it's going to be fine, but it's not going to be fine. Because I've experienced things and I've experienced these concepts that's brought out in the spirit of prophecy and the Bible. And it's easier experiencing it with Christ on your side than doing it on your own. On your own, you question even God himself for the actions that he's done. You question God himself in such a harsh manner that you risk losing him completely. So when you get to the state of repentance, it begins with Christ. Through the whole process of repentance, Christ is with you. And at the point of forgiveness, Christ is with you. And at the point of overcoming after that forgiveness, of overcoming your sin and your trauma and everything, Christ is still with you. Do not divorce Christ from leading in this process. You know, salvation is through God and Christ alone. And if we understand that concept of salvation, Why can't we apply it to repentance too? Why do we need to be so fearful of God that asking him for forgiveness for the wrongs we've done is not something we can do? It's not something we want to do because we're incapable of doing it without him. So what basically is being said here that only through Christ this is possible is that you want forgiveness from Christ. You want forgiveness from God. And you want to go to God. 
You can't do it alone. To get the forgiveness from Christ, you need Christ to be with you. It's an interesting concept, but this is where the beauty of it comes in. God is saying, I am in control. I, am, I have authority, you know. And the idea of repentance is also telling us that even though I'm in control, I have authority as Christ. I'm going to hold your hand as you ask me for forgiveness. And I'm going to walk you through this process of forgiveness, holding your hand, telling you each step of the way, how we're going to make this right. And how you're going to overcome, how you're going to turn away from whatever sin it is, if it's alcohol, pornography, if it's um, domestic violence, abuse, how you're going to turn yourself away from this and your repentance process. God walks through, walks with us through our repentance processes and we need to allow him to do this. You know, the quote, resistance is futile, is really something that applies in repentance. And I think Mother White also brought this idea out so beautifully. You know, once your heart is converted, and once you're convicted of your sins, but you resist wanting to repent, it becomes such a toxic trait that you end up jeopardizing your whole walk with salvation, you know? To resist the action of repentance, it's like resisting, you know, the opportunity to be forgiven. And God will not allow you to be with him if you can't even ask him and yourself for forgiveness. You know, I truly believe in the concept that you need to forgive yourself first. You need to work on yourself before you seek others' forgiveness. You need to be able to remove yourself from your problems completely and forgive yourself for what you've done wrong. Um, but that's just my opinion on that. I, I don't know where other people may stand on it. But yeah, that's just one other thing. Um, so just to recap on what we did here today, we got a bit of a definition of what repentance is. We got to know that there's a fake understanding of repentance. We mentioned three biblical characters that actually brought out the the fake repentance aspects and we also mentioned that it is only through Christ and sincerity that you know we can achieve this repentance and that resistance is futile there's one important thing that I missed and that I want to mention now it is the prayer of David it illustrates to us how we are to repent and I'm going to read the whole thing now it's from Psalms 32 verse 1 and 2 and then also Psalms 51, 1 to 14. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord inputted not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Mm. That's just so powerful. And then the second text reads, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto thy multitude of thy tender mercies, Blot out my transgressions, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sins is ever before me. Purge me with hyssop, with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be made whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirits. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. You know, it's just, it's so wonderful listening to that prayer of David and realizing we can actualize that prayer in our current situation. We can call upon the prayer of David and pray it daily for our repentance because we know that God is capable of forgiving us for what we've done wrong. You know, I, I don't know where you stand in life and I don't know what you're going through now listening to this, but I want you to know that whatever you do, if it's repentance, consecration, anything you're learning about, don't divorce God from the process. As a final note on repentance, I want to leave you with this. 
You see, repentance is not just about making yourself right with God and yourself. It has to do with the whole process of discipleship. Without it, fear, guilt, and suffering will reign forever. So I pray that you that are watching this today understand that you need to seek true repentance and that God will bless you. Thank you so much for listening. Goodbye.